looks like we might as well go ahead and get started now. We got, uh, yeah. this is our uh, second uh, builder showcase. Elaine, it's her, it's her, uh, her baby here. She, uh, she's the one that came up with the idea and I have given her co-hosting rights. So I'm just going to let her take it over. And, uh, we don't have a lot of people, so I'll, let's just, everybody can keep their mics open and, uh, and keep their cameras on if they want to. And we'll just let, let Elaine take on over here for us. All right. Well, thank you, Robbie. I have to tell you that, uh, our, 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 we have two guests tonight and the first is Doug Murphy and also, uh, Peter Burroughs. And I have to tell you that Doug is actually where I got this idea because when he finished his first guitar, his dreadnought, he played this really cool song. And I was like, man, I wish everybody did that. And that guitar sounds really good. I'd like to know more about that guitar. And so that's when I thought, you know, there's been a lot of these guitars. And actually, Peter, I think they, you've got a palette when you're going to talk about a little bit in the second half, probably. And uh, I'm I always been fascinated by somebody built a guitar out of pallets and how those things sounded. And so um, I, I have to say, this is a fun night for me because you two sort of are what spurred me on to try to do this. And I also, you know, I'm a, I'm a novice builder. I've got three of them and I don't know if one will ever be right. It might be firewood and we've got two resonators and uh, people think they're good, but I don't know about that. So I consider myself a novice and I'm really interested in some of the trials and tribulations you have as a novice and what helps you move on beyond that and so that I think that's some of the benefit we can offer as us novices and you remember your first ones we commiserate on what happened to us and what we can how you get better faster and things that really help so with that um Doug let me start with you so you got the Dugginator if you're looking at your <laughs> pictures and that's Doug Murphy so Doug where are you where are you located I'm in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, just a little bit over the New Jersey border. So um, I think what I'd like to do first is just let you play that guitar of yours. And uh, uh, I kept thinking that sure did sound different than my OM. And yeah. there's a good reason for that. It's a dreadnought. So if you want to tell us a little bit about the guitar while I get us started up with uh, playing it, then uh, we'll get going. So the floor is all yours. All right. Uh, well, yeah, what got me started into, into building it, uh, I just kind of hit a point I wanted a dreadnought. I have an OM Martin and uh, yeah, eventually I got like an advertisement about, you know, making one at a, a community college. And uh, I was like, well, for that price, I'll just start buying tools. And, you know, if I really take to it, then uh, I can keep building. So that was really what uh, spurred it on. All right. So I love this song. It's a great choice for your new companion. And uh, so with that, let's, let's just give this a whirl. Just like my guitar Yeah, she's near as tall As me She fits just like my guitar 
Yeah, she's near as tall as me. She lives way out the D train. Yeah, she's Texas as can be. She's got a homespun disposition. Yeah, just as gentle as you please. She's got a homespun disposition. Yeah, just as gentle as you please. She's got two arms like rattlesnakes. Legs like a willow in the green. Got a brand new companion. I'm gonna do right this time. Got a brand new companion. Yeah, I'm gonna do right this time. Gonna track her with my body. I'm gonna trace her with my mind. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Yep. So, Doug, that's clearly not your first time to ever pick up a guitar and play it. So, <laughs> I'm guessing you you've played a lot of guitars over the years. Um, when you think about the one you built and and think about playability and tone, how do you compare this to other guitars you've played? Um, I think what really kind of blew my mind was when I picked it up like side by side with uh, my Martin OM. I mean, it's not a high end Martin, it's kind of mid-level, but just, uh, you know, it, it really has a punch and a liveliness. I mean, I know they're two different body styles, but uh, they just sound completely different. Um, and it, it was uh, really cool to see that like, you know, even as a, a first guitar, you know, it, it can really hold its own with a Martin, uh, which was a really cool feeling. Yeah, I really like the clarity. But what about the playability of the guitar? Uh, it plays great, um, you know, all the Easy. way up the fretboard. Uh, yeah. Um, I made the neck a little beefier than I, I planned on, but, I, I mean, I still like it. I have no problem playing it. Um, 
I might lower the action a little bit. I still need to do a, a second setup, but I mean, overall, like it just doesn't cause me any problems. You know, I, I really enjoy playing it. So, um, it was interesting you said you decided it's time for a dreadnought and you just build your own. So uh, most people say it's time for a dreadnought and head off to the music store. Right. So what, what what's your background? What led you to believe or get interested in building your own? Believe you could and get interested in it. Tell us about that. Um, well, yeah, it started out, I, I got like, you know, this newsletter in the mail from the local county college. And, uh, you know, it was like, build your own dreadnought. And I had been like, you know, kind of uh, thinking of, just going to the store and buying one. And, uh, but in order to build a dread, you had to build a parlor guitar. And while I have nothing against making a parlor guitar, uh, it still ended up being like three grand or so. And I was like, ah, for that price, I might as well just uh, see if I can do it. Um, one of my uncles, he's made a couple guitars, a couple of really nice guitars too. And, uh, you know, he was really excited about the idea too. So, you know, I had someone that could help me out and he definitely did. And uh, yeah, and I was like, well, why not? I think it would be something fun, you know. And uh, so yeah, you, just gave it a shot. You build this following along with Robbie's course. Yep, yep. Yeah, so originally I bought uh, the kit. You know, I just kind of put together what I would want to make. And then I got everything in the mail and, you know, started looking through the plans and everything and just got completely overwhelmed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was just, uh, you know, thinking like, ah, I can just go based off of YouTube videos. And there are so many, but even with all those, I mean, honestly, like the online course I couldn't have done without, um, you know, cause just having everything lined up in order, what you need to do and, you know, step-by-step. Step, uh, it was just so important. And uh, yeah, I mean, even even with that, you know, there's still so much you have to figure out on your own, you know, based on what you have and what you think you can do. So what what do you think, what, what was really the, the easiest about the whole process? Oof. <laughs> That's a <laughs> <Nothing>. good question. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, opening the box, that might, that might have been the easiest thing. Elaine, when you get a chance, uh, huh? <laughs> Elaine, when you get a chance, Steve's got a question, too, so. Okay, so uh, let's let him talk about what, what, what seemed to work pretty well. For me, joining the back for somehow and, and the top, those two people, somehow that was easy for me. Nothing else was, but that, I was really surprised <laughs> how easy that was. So, but I'm sort of interested in, um, in, in what seemed pretty easy. You were surprised, but what? <laughs> you're still shaking your head about um i mean it, it was nice when there were like more relaxing steps where they weren't so uh stress inducing but it's funny you say joining the back and the top because i had such a tough time with that um <laughs> but that was uh that was when i learned the importance of you know quality sandpaper because uh you know i was using like harbor freight sandpaper <laughs> to try and you know joint the the back and you know, I, I worked in my basement, so I didn't have a window. So I was up and down the stairs, like, you know, almost a hundred times, just like putting it against the door, checking it. <laughs> like, I, I can't imagine what my neighbors thought, you know, just seeing me just like putting these pieces of wood on the, on the sliding door and then like getting mad and storming off downstairs and coming <laughs> back up a couple minutes later doing the same thing. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's hard to say what was easy. I mean, but I, I I just really enjoyed all of it. You know, even the you know the pains. You know, it was it was just enjoyable. Steve, what's your question? My my question was for Doug, and my question is, uh, what's your next guitar going to be? Uh, I actually have the materials for the next one. Um, I'm making an OM for my brother. Um, and it's already given me problems. Uh, I'm so, <laughs> so we can, we can already say that you have the disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even even during the first build, I was like, oh, yeah, this is the first of many. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm doing bacote for back and sides, and uh, bending the sides has been a bit of an issue. I cracked the first one, so 
trying to uh, figure out what I can do for it. But I, I think I'm just going to try and get another set of size because I feel more comfortable with it now after ruining it. But <laughs> <laughs> so but how yeah, are you so, bending them? How are you bending uh, them? I, I got the uh, the Stumac bending iron. So doing it by hand. Mm. Yep. Yep. Good. The yeah. quality looked pretty good. Do, do you have woodworking experience for a first guitar? <laughs> Very you little. Um, you know, I've I've made like a couple tables with friends, which you know is not very close but <laughs> so really no uh it was just kind of give it a shot because you went with fingerboard bindings and everything yep yep um that that wasn't really planned i mean so so many of my plans changed you know throughout the build mm -hmm. so let me call up your slides that show your guitar a little closer and we'll just look at it here yep. if i can figure out how to do that again All right, so hopefully you all can see this here in just a bit. Here we go. So that's a, I've got some some uh, slides of the front, back, all that, the um, headstock. So um, yeah, so questions here. Anybody want to talk about this? I was sort of interested in how you made your rosette. Uh, well, that that was just uh, one I picked from the, uh, the LMI. Uh, Kit Wizard is just a Indian rosewood rosette. It's kind of hard to see in that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks a little dark, um, but yeah, that that proved a little bit tougher than I thought. You know, because when I picked it, I didn't know anything about you know pour filling. So trying to pour fill such a small area without staining any area <laughs> around it. Uh, yeah. But luckily, it, it turned out all right, and I, you know I was really happy with the fit. And, uh, so the lessons begin early, don't they? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it reminds me, uh, I went up and spent a week with Greg Maxwell last May, and uh, we were talking, and we came up with the, the main line to a new country song, and it's, I cried when I saw the rosewood bleed, because you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you wants to finish it and sing it for us, that'd be great. But, yeah, that was oh, great. I was just thinking about that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what, what's the finish, Doug? Uh, that's a true oil finish. Um, okay. It was uh, Dustin helped me out. You know, I was emailing him such rookie questions, you know, and he was so patient with me, uh, you know, just telling me like exactly step by step what I should do. And, uh, you know, it was tremendously helpful. Um, you know, originally I was going to try a spray lacquer with my uncle, but that was right during, you know, the shutdown, stay at home orders. I was like, all right, so I'll. I'll try something different. So you got all of those those uh, curly maple bindings bent without breaking them? I broke the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Had to order a couple more. Sometimes those just separate. I mean, it's just that's the, that's funky wood. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I found that out. Let's see, get another shot. Wow, here. looks great. Yeah, nice hey, job. Thank you. Thank nice you. job. Thank you. Did you make your own purflings there or did you buy those? I, I bought them. Yeah. How'd you find it to bend those? Uh, it was, it was no problem. That was, that might've been an easy step actually. <laughs> okay. Wow. And I broke all four of my binding pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. He even got a little inlay on the peg head. I know. I'm impressed. Yep. yep. Yeah. It's a uh, black mother of pearl. Uh, I got from DePaul. Uh, and yeah, you know, when I was cutting the, uh, well, one of the longer pieces, you know, I had the vacuum aimed at it and I learned the lesson of, you know, holding onto the piece. Cause as soon as the piece broke right into the vacuum, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> I was just kind of sitting there in disbelief for a second. And so I had to dump everything out on the floor and I picked it out and it was fine. Yeah, <laughs> it worked. Yeah. This, your work is really of screen great. taped over the end of your uh, vacuum. What's that? A piece of screen taped over the end of your vacuum tube. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. Yeah. <laughs> Same way you found out. Yep. Yep. Heard of people yep. also taping a little piece of pantyhose or something over it. 
Yeah, yeah. same thing. That, yeah. that works well. Yeah. I don't know. Doug doesn't look like the pantyhose kind of guy. But. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with a, a name like Dugginator, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we know in these Zoom meetings, you just seem to waste up. <laughs> So, Doug, talk, talk to me. One of my issues um, was that, so I watched everything through for, you know, Robbie says, watch all the videos. So I did. And I made all these notes about all these tools I was going to have. But I still didn't understand what they were. I just knew they had names. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, um, it, you know, I, I'd get something. I'd try to do it. You know, you're just doing this maybe one time way. And that'd just be a disaster, and I'd just end up buying whatever it took and, and fixing it. So I don't know if that was your experience or not. But Peter, I guess we'll start rolling you in here too, because you, you sort of said you've come up with a lot of tools that um, hopefully save you some money when you're getting started, get you by maybe permanently. I'm not sure, but go ahead and talk to us about your your beginning starts. You started well, making yeah. three at once, correct? My I start had it started in a dumpster. I, I was uh, part of the manager at this place down. Oh, it's like 1980 down in Florida. And I took out the trash one day, and here's a couple of beautiful walnut boards sticking out of the dumpster. And oh boy, that looks pretty good. I was going to build a brick and board shelf anyway, so well, it was really nice walnut. So uh, I got the idea. Hey, I could I could build a guitar. You know, this is 1980. There's just nothing available. There's no internet. Uh, I did have a book, though, that my dad had bought me a long time ago, uh, hoping that I would build a guitar someday. You've all probably seen I have that book. Yeah, <laughs> right. And so I had decided I wanted to build a 12-string. I really like 12 strings. I'd had one before. It had been a, been a while since I had one. And this is all I had to build it with. Um, so I did. Uh, and... Uh, I was, I was really broke. I, I was in reduced circumstances at that time in my life. Um, so I resawed this beautiful four quarter, they were table leaves. Uh, I resawed this four quarter board into four thicknesses by hand with a carpenter's rip saw, oh which gosh. is still hanging on the wall over there. Wow. Um, you, yeah. Your arms must have uh, um, gone back to their usual flabbiness <laughs> since then. Well, I was a young stud back then. <laughs> I don't think I would do that now. Uh, for one thing, I'm smarter than that. But anyway, I successfully uh, uh, thinned down and the, the sides cleaned up at about two millimeters in some spots in the upper bout. And, uh, you know, it's good for bending. Um, the one mistake I made was I just drew the outline, something I thought looked good. Uh, 17 inches wide, and it's almost five inches thick. It's actually right here if you want to see it. And it turns out, it turns out it will not fit in an off-the-shelf case. So uh, <laughs> I had to modify a jumbo case just to hold it and stuff, but I still play it and I love it. So anyway, I Man. got the sides bent. Um, I got the top joined. I uh, put these little purfling lines in and I had the neck shape, kind of a rookie mistake. I had the neck completely shaped. This is all Spanish heel, right? And once it's all shaped, it's really hard to hold on to. But oh, well, I worked around that. But after by 1984, and I was really busy working like two jobs, so I didn't have much time. But by 1984, it sort of went on the shelf with life, family, uh, moving, career, jobs, all kinds of kids, everything. Um, so it actually kind of sat in the dust for about 30 years. And then uh, along about 2011, I said, damn, I'm going to finish this thing. And I pulled it out. By then, there was the internet. And I actually ran across a luthier named James Einholf. And I think he was in the Red Rocks. Uh, yeah, he was one of my former students up at the college there. There you go. Well, he steered me towards you, and uh, that was helpful because by then I'd gotten quite a bit more done on it. But uh, then I got to the finishing stage, and phew, boy, I was lost. Finishing has never been a strong suit with me. I'm just going to set this down a sec. So finishing wasn't going real well, and uh, so I decided to call you up, and I, I scheduled a little uh, consulting time. I remember that. I, I was freaking out, you know, I didn't, oh man, after all the work I put into this thing, I figured out that all the time I had put in, if I'd actually 
put in the same amount of time weekends working overtime or something like that, this cost me about twelve thousand dollars to build it. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I needed a shrink more than I needed a luthier, but Robbie served both purposes and looked it over, and we got a plan for finishing with the with the, with the finishing and everything. But I'm really happy with it. I still play it all the time. Um, there's a lot that's wrong with it. Um, I would never do. I would never advise a beginner to do ebony bindings. Those things are really hard to bend. They're broken mm. about uh, six places. Well, you can only there's only one place where you can actually see that they broke. Yeah, I'd have to point it out to you. And the, the fretboard is fairly curved. It's like maybe a 20, 24 inch uh, radius because I didn't know anything about radii. Um, top's curved about you know, maybe 30, 30 foot radius. So that's about right. Um, but it's a good player. Uh, I want to build another one. And they're kind of like eating potato chips. You can't Peter, just do one. Let me interrupt you for a second. And I'll ask the group. Um, if you're building a first guitar, what would probably be the easiest bindings to work with? Oh, well, no bindings. bindings. Well, <laughs> moving ahead to the to the kit, because because after the you know success of that, it was like, all right, now I have to learn how to really build guitars. So I bought Robbie's steel string course, and I got the kit from LMI, and uh, yeah, that's that's the path I should have been on. And, uh, but yeah, I broke all four pieces of binding right away on the when I got to that stage with the kit, and um, we ended up bending some more plain maple. Um, let's see. Here's here's the kit guitar. As I said, I built three at once. This is the only one that I still have. But I found some maple that I don't know if you can see any of that. It's got a little bit of a figure in it. Anyway, it worked out. Um, I think it's maple, might be beach. I'm not sure. Some, you know, used scrap stuff I had around the shop. Everything else is from the kit, though, I think. Uh, there are some woods that are easy to bend. Going back to the Irving Sloan book, um, the sides of the 12 string were bent by boiling it in a little trough. He shows you how to make a, uh, a trough out of flashing and you sort of origami the end so there's no seams. You lay it across two burners of the stove, boil it for a little bit, lay it over a form. And that worked really well for the 12 string. If you ask me what's the easiest part of the 12 string, I'd say, well, bending the size, that was, that was a piece of cake. Um, so, and in the book, he talks about rosewood, mahogany, walnut, and maple, those being easy ones to bend. And I think you could probably bend any of those with boiling method today. Uh, I'm not sure about some of the modern, you know, tone what's we're using now, Zircoat and uh, wingy and stuff like that. I have no idea. I work with them myself, and I don't know whether they'd respond to boiling or not. Uh, I, I think uh, boiling uh, to bend sides at my house would be very expensive. Why's that? Uh, because of the wife? divorce lawyer involved. <laughs> what? The divorce lawyer involved. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Get your own stove. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just to get my own Yeah, but yeah, bending is an interesting topic because that sort of got me into building three at once. Um, you know, easiest part was opening the box, and one of the first steps uh, Robbie goes into on the course is bending the sides. And oh, cow, you know, if I break the sides, it's expensive. You know, I'm gonna have to buy another set of sides or something. So, practice sides. I'd heard of the concept of practice sides, and I had you know bands off for resawing, so I had a forklift pallet, resawed some nice practice sides. And uh, that went pretty well. Um, that was, uh, turned out to be, it was a really nice forklift pallet actually, because it was a spalted maple, nice streaks in it, some wormholes and stuff like that. And beautiful nail holes, all rusty and everything. Um, so I still was a little chicken and I knew that walnut, you know, did, went well because I'd done that before. And I had actually the other table leaf that I'd never, that I'd never uh, used because it only took one table leaf to build the 12 string. Um, so I saw that up, that went well. And uh, oh, and this is all hot pipe. Um, a, lot of, a lot of this process, I decided intentionally to do things the hard way. That is, it would have been easy to spend a lot of money and get the LMI bending machine, but A, I didn't have that much money. And B, I, I was really attracted to the idea that you feel the wood. Um, I don't think your steel string course covers the hot pipe bending 
but you have a video on that. I have a video on that on YouTube. Uh, my classical course, I included it in there as a bonus video, but it's on YouTube. So. Right, right. Yeah. So I got that. And I liked how you described you can feel when the wood's ready to bend. Yeah. I like, I'm sort of a feely, touchy guy. Um, and I think that was a charcoal. Um, it was a three inch pipe filled with charcoal. That's the heat yeah, source. Yeah, you get extra points for charcoal. I, I just made one with that. Fact, let's see, it's right here. This is the uh, deluxe $25 from Home Depot. There you uh, go. Park. Nice. And one thing I did was it was getting a little scorchy on some of the maple. So I put a sleeve of an old jersey around it, 100% cotton. Don't do it for polyester. And it really helped. It kept them from scorching and it also kind of retained the water and turned it into steam. It's it's kind of something I've used ever since. Um, so, nice. yeah, but extra points for charcoal. <laughs> there are a lot of guitars that way. Doug, yeah. did you start with a bender? Did you start with a bender or did you uh, mess up some sides and decide maybe you were going to the bender? Because that's what I did. I tried a pipe, <laughs> uh, the, the heating I, iron, and I just thought, this isn't working well for me. <laughs> After a little practice, it just, <laughs> just broke down. I knew I was hooked and I'd be bending a lot of sides by then. So what about you? Uh, no, I, I just went right ahead and bought the uh, the Stumac iron. And, uh, you know, I got some practice sides too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, it went well with the the rosewood. You know, now I really appreciate how uh, easily the the rosewood bent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's that's worked well. I like that teardrop shape when I'm bending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it yeah, because it you could be heating a large portion and sort of work off the bottom a little bit at a time and right. work your way down. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this one's good for dreadnoughts, um, but uh, I had to build another one when I came up against a Venetian cutaway. Mm. Uh, basically the same thing, except I squashed the tube in a vise. Uh, that'll work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, rosewood is great. And I have to, I hate to brag, this is my, you know, uh, 1954 Corvette and an old barn story, but that same dumpster I pulled the walnut out of. I looked inside to see if there was anything else good, and there was a Brazilian rosewood tabletop, about nice. 39 inches wide and about well, 60, 65 inches long. Wow. And I pulled that out. A big dumpster. Yeah, I got four back and side sets out of that. Wow. That bends very nicely, too. That was a good dumpster diving wow. uh, day yeah. there. Huh? Oh, I went back for weeks after that. What, where is this done. dumpster? <laughs> 40 it years, years ago, ago when it was in Florida. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. You never know. I like I said, I went back weeks and weeks after that. No, nothing. Somebody was throwing out furniture. Wow. So, so let me but, ask the group. We got a lot of experience here. If if you had a a new a new builder that or potential new builder that was watching this. What kind of advice would you give them starting out other than don't quit? What what would don't start? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. I, I think I would give the advice is to get either a book or a course like Robbie's that it's one process from the beginning to the end. Because if oh, we yeah. go to YouTube, but there's the idea with new builders is that everyone does each step the same. And they don't realize it's a continue. You know, there's there's a million different processes to make a guitar, and they don't mix and match. So if you do a YouTube video, if you do one on bending, yeah, that's pretty good. But if you do, you know, anytime you're dealing with geometry of the body and the neck, if you don't have a process that takes you from beginning to the end, you're going to get a mishmash. Of um, I agree, the continuity of the course was tremendous. Yeah, yeah. yeah I found Another that. thing too is is patience. Um, you know, and Robbie, in your videos, you talk a lot about production schedules and, and that, and, and that can get you thinking and you get excited because you want to complete this thing. And it's, right. It worked. But, and, and my uh, biggest snafus come when I just get too anxious and, and try to move on, either skipping or, you know, just going too fast. So having that patience, reminding myself that if there's no hurry, uh, makes for better quality. That's good advice. Yeah, I think uh, you have to accept your mistakes because they, they will come often, they will come early, and they are relentless. And, you know, to the, to the extent that, uh, that that you don't beat yourself up for, like, the really stupid things you do. 
And then for the things that come out of nowhere and it took me a couple of guitars to not get upset about some of the dumb stuff. And once I let all that go, I found out that the mistakes could lead you to other places that were equally valuable as if you had done it right the first time. Some of those are called design opportunities. <laughs> that building off of that is that if you make a mistake, put your tools down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't throw them down though, right? Don't throw them down. Just put them down because you'll have a better idea in an hour the next morning than you'll have right away. What, what, and that goes along with the patience, down. right? What one thing that that I had the privilege of was was taking the class in person with Robbie at the college when he was teaching there. And the one thing I remember, Robbie, was you you said at one time during the semester, we can fix anything but a broken heart. <laughs> well, I didn't have a broken heart, but the the part part of what you need as a new builder is confidence in the fact that you can fix whatever thing, whatever you screw up. It just takes time, put the tool down, think about it you'll figure it out. Um, that to me was a, a real blessing to, to know that. It Don't was great. Sweat it. Don't sweat yeah, it. it. You can fix anything. It, it's only a piece of wood, but um, it, you know, it, it was great to have that classroom experience because of those kinds of things, because, because I saw, what were there 15 people in each class? Yeah. And on Saturday, they were probably Saturdays. There were probably 50 people running around building things. Yep. You saw every kind of mistake that could possibly have been made. You had the opportunity to see it and then see the solution that Robbie or somebody else would come up with to fix it. That was just gold. I used to, uh, I used to cook for a living. I used to, and I remember in culinary school, the instructor told us, you know, the difference between a cook and a chef is everybody makes mistakes. Chefs, knows how, chefs know how to fix them. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. <laughs> it's the same thing with woodworking. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I discovered building three at once. You can you can be very efficient about your mistakes. It's possible to screw up <laughs> three guitars in a row with no extra effort. <laughs> when I got to the binding stage, and I sh I should say that once I got to the, the rosewood bent, I looked back and said, well, gee, I could build a guitar out of all three of these things. And the philosophy I developed was like, okay, I'll practice on this one. That would be number two. And then I'll get better on number three. And then I'll be an expert by the time I get to the kit with the expensive rosewood. And that kind of worked out, you know, so I got, and, and it also tended to burn in the lessons. So uh, I've done that very I, thing. I've built multiple guitars and it does. Yeah. It does it give an opportunity. It, it's a very good way to learn. Yeah. And then I got the binding uh, rabbits cut pretty, pretty well. I just had an ordinary router and, uh, and a little stick of wood clamped to the edge. So I could go around the edge. You know, it's pretty primitive, but it worked. There's a workaround for somebody that doesn't want to spend money. But then I uh, cut the rabbit for the for the uh, purfling, and I wanted it to look like uh, the Southern Jumbo because I'd had one at one time. I just loved that thing. Um, well, I set that thing wrong, and I cut the, the channel too wide. And boy, well, you know, I set down my jewels and didn't come back till the next day on that one. But then I found a, a video on radial purfling. And uh, I've been doing it on guitars ever since. And I just finished it on, on this one that's on the bench. I don't know if you can see it, but basically lay in uh, a Teflon yeah, Hold, hold it still there just a second. The camera focus. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. So you lay in a Teflon strip as if you were doing a uh, abalone job. Mm -hmm. Then you pull it out and put in... Uh, some radial purfling. And if you Google radial purfling, it'll that video will come right up and tell us the whole whole thing. And it's a uh, you know re renewable resource. It doesn't involve uh, animals and stuff like that. So I kind of got to like it. I've done it on most of my guitars since. So that was a uh, we'll call that your next recovery guitar because every that, mistake you make, you recover from it. Yeah, that that's when somebody told me that the term was. Uh, a design opportunity. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think for my guitar, uh, the black white purfling on the sides, that was not in the plans. Uh, that was because I just routed the channel too deep. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was like, oh no, what do I do now? And then just figured to try 
adding in something to take up the space. You know, like, like yeah, well, like you guys are saying, creative problem solving. Like that's that's really so much of it because it doesn't go according to plan. Doug, how long did it take you from start to finish to get that done? Uh probably close to like a year and a half. It, okay. it, it took a while. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you got family life and day job and all that kind of stuff. So. Right. Yeah. 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 Very nice. So what you find to be the most difficult. What did you find the most difficult part on the first guitar? Uh, the binding was definitely a challenge. Um, the, uh, the neck to body joint was definitely, uh, I, I would say that was number one. That, that took me a while. Uh, I took the time following the plans to make the, uh, the Morris and Tenon jig, mm -hmm. but I, I did it as a dovetail. And like, I guess I was just filing at the wrong angle to try to get the dovetail to fit right. So it was just fighting me. I had to build up the joint and then try again. And it, that, that took a while to get right. It's admirable. I can barely make a right angle. <laughs> <laughs> so when you build your next guitar, are you going to still do dovetail or are you going to do straight Morris and Tenon? Uh, yeah, I'll do a dovetail. Okay. Yeah, I did a dovetail on those three uh, dreadnoughts. Mm -hmm. and then I went to uh, bolt-ons, and they were good too. But then I finally got back to dovetails because I had built the uh, the jig like you did, right. um, and uh, I kind of like the dovetail. I'm getting handy with that uh, router jig and everything, and I got a nice router to go with it. So mm -hmm. I'm doing dovetails again. Uh, Elaine was saying something that you, you built a lot of your own jigs or tools or such like that? As much as possible. I, I built my own uh, outside mold for uh, for the Dreadnought. I've built six molds since then. Um, and I deviate from uh, the way Robbie goes about uh, building guitars. He's, he's learned a lot about guitars by building OMs and classicals over and over and over, changing every little uh, thing, you know, the wood, the bracing, the thickness and all these things. So you learn how to build like the world's finest guitar that way. And I, I will never really get there because um, I have short attention span and I have a lot of different wild guitars that I want to build. Um, so that's partly why I bent with a hot pipe because I didn't want to invest in a form for each shape. Um, let's see, I built dreads, I built the oddball 12 OM, um, let's see, I just finished a mold for a 17 inch jumbo and two sizes of uh, ukuleles. Um, and I've, I've built some really weird guitars, which we won't go into here. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have you on the, on again, one of these builder showcases here, Peter, to, to highlight that uh, corrugated metal mm. uh, oh, guitar top you did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so cool. Yeah. yeah. There, I have another one in the works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes bracing a lot easier. Uh, yeah, there's only one tiny little brace in, in <laughs> one I built. It's a, it's a round hole. I made it a round hole because it was so experimental. I needed to be able to reach inside and adjust bracing and stuff. I'm now in the process of taking one pickup up, out and putting something else in and stuff like that. It's still sort of experimental. But meanwhile, I've already started a 17-inch uh, jazz guitar size. So... So I think one of the things I had to learn as a novice, I'm, I'm a, a bluegrass player, and I had in my head that there was probably this optimum thing that uh, I needed to get to. And any deviation meant that I was getting away from optimum a little bit. So uh, I had to learn that, no, there, there there's lots of guitars, and they all have their own sound, and who knows if they're better or worse, and, and that you, you do best you can on all of them, and you take care of the design opportunities and and you know if you get that angle right where it plays pretty well at some level they're fairly forgiving it when you get to the class of let's let's build my first guitar and it's probably going to be sort of mediocre it's still better than a lot of things you go by oh, and, yeah. uh, and so I think that was one of the things I had to learn is that there was no way I could be meticulous enough on my first guitar that it was going to be as good as the best guitar ever made it, it just no way and so, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not a great guitar because it is. It, it was, in fact, somebody bought it from me. But um, oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, there uh -huh. you go. Somebody else liked it, so that was good. Yep. So, uh, Doug, you're starting an OEM. So that means new molds and, and yeah, some, yeah, for you. And uh, yep. so, what wood will you be using on it? I'm sorry, what was that? What wood will you be using? 
Uh, it's Picote for the back and sides. I got a, a bear claw Sitka top, um, another mahogany neck. Uh, I got a blackwood fingerboard. Uh, I got Koa binding, so we'll see how that bends. And uh, uh, what else was there? I think that was. I think that was it. Um, you know, I wanted to try some mitered purfling for this one. I wanted to maybe do a, a lacquer finish. Um, you know, those were the two kind of goals, you know, for this one. And also try and get a, a better binding job, do a, a better one, better binding job than for my first. So those are my focuses for this one. Well, you know, Doug and everybody else, you know, when you're on stage playing it, nobody's going to see the binding job. All right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> it's it's the perfectionist in all of us. Oh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So anyone else, what would be some advice for somebody just getting ready to build that first guitar or moving on to their next two and no, number two and number three? I got a tool that I've been trying to popularize, and it's a Stanley number 80 scraper plane. And it holds the scraper at a little bit of an angle. And uh, you sharpen that blade at about 45 degrees so that when you turn the burr with your, uh, you know, whatever it is you're going to turn the burr with, you get a much bigger hook. And what that does is this is a stock removal demon. You can really take off stock. And a lot of new guys don't have a drum sander yet. And so I try to steer people towards these. They're thick on the ground on eBay. You can pick them up for like 30 bucks or something like that. Um, and it saves your wrists, takes off a lot of stock. I thin down the sides on, well, let's see, up to number four with this. And then hmm. after that, I got the drum sander because I could see it's like potato chips. You can't just eat one and I'm hooked, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, great tool, Stanley number 80. I second that. I have one. I have two, actually. Oh, yeah. Mm. They're, they're great. Yeah, and the card scrapers I still use for a little bit more finish uh, surface. Nice And for scraping bindings, somehow this card scraper is the one. So, oh, and another, another cheap tool is the uh, Harbor Freight. This is one of those tools that people, well, I'll use this piece of junk and then I'll upgrade later. And that's all these little, um, all these little- uh, That's what I use. About 30 bucks worth of clamps, you got enough for the whole side. Yep. And not a single one is broken. I'm now on number 18 or something like that, 19, I guess. And uh, they're great little clamps, super cheap. Oh, and another Harbor, another Harbor Freight. You can get a set of four of these in different sizes. And I figured, well, I can get by with this until I get a spindle sander. I have not been motivated to shop for a spindle sander. You just stick this in the drill press and do a lot of stuff with them. That was like yeah. eight bucks or something like that for the whole set. Yep, those are great tools. Yeah. Speaking of tools, I've got a question for you, for the group here. Uh, I've been corresponding with a guy over the last couple of days. And it's starting to get pretty time involved. He sent me a... Excel spreadsheet with a whole list of tools and he wants me to go through it and, and give it the thumb, thumbs up or thumbs down. And I, I, I tell everybody, if you'll notice, I, I never included a tool list with my mm -hmm. courses. And the reason for that is I didn't want people to have to feel obligated to go out and buy the tools that I had in order to be able to build the instrument. Uh, I wasn't in the business of pushing tools. And uh, there's so many alternative ways of doing things, you know, quick little internet search, you'll find half a dozen ways to do the same thing. So I never put out a, a, a tool list. Um, how did you guys do? Did you, did you, uh, you know, stress about the tools? Uh, because this guy's, you know, he's got it down to the penny about what he needs to buy. And I usually tell people, go out and watch my entire course before you buy anything. Because that way you can see perhaps what you already have in the way of, you know, bench tools, a scraper or, you know, uh, uh, screwdriver or you know, hand planes or files or something. Then I say, okay, then you can, you can see what perhaps you can make. Cause there's a lot of tools you can make and jigs and you can make. And then finally you get out the credit card and purchase the stuff that you want to. Um, how did you folks do it? Did you buy everything at once? Did you ease into it? Did you dip, dip your toe in the water? Or how'd you guys do it? I got really lucky with um there there was a member of the forum very very early on when i joined this this goes back six seven eight years ago and um he unfortunately had to unload everything because he got um got his eyes were going really bad 
And at that time, he put out this big list of stuff, and it had all these very, it had a whole bunch of tools on it. And and he saw he was selling some really good, not you know, not not Cadillac tools, but just really good, solid Stanley stuff and things that he'd used and worked. And I, I was I was fortunate enough to end up getting pretty much a core tool set, and it wasn't a lot of stuff. A couple of planes, you know, some wood, some uh, scrapers, just little stuff. But enough to get me going after really researching everything for a long time and watching uh, your course. And, uh, you know, I wanted to go the hand tool route. And that, that, that served me really well because uh, now I'm, I'm full-blown tool junkie. But, you know, I, I still rely on, uh, you know, pretty much the same basic set of hand tools. And, you know, my favorite tools is, is the bandsaw. I think the bandsaw is the thing I use the most in the shop power tool-wise. But. Okay. It, I, I paid a lot of attention to your course and I paid a lot of attention to what everybody on this forum was saying, what they liked and what worked. Was, was that Gregoire? Yes. Yeah. How's he? Yeah, I bought, how's he on, uh, I bought a lot of stuff secondhand on offer up. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, secondhand. <clears throat> so you guys didn't have to, you didn't feel obligated to go out and spend a lot of money <laughs> to be able to build this guitar in the way of tools. Yeah. No, I didn't. Okay. You know, you 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 did a really good job of kind of dissuading you from going out there and you know, you know, going hook, line, and sinker into the uh, Lee Valley catalog or Stu Matt catalog and going nuts. Why? You know, that's yeah. good advice. Yeah, I see that all the time where people just spend all kinds of money and then they come take a class with me and they figure, oh, I didn't need half of this stuff. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah, the people who buy everything at once, it's an opportunity for someone else to buy it back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's classified to something in the OLF forum. <laughs> I, I met a fellow in uh, in Paracho, Mexico, who uh, he, he's a he's a worldwide luthier. He builds some pretty good stuff, but he uh, showed me that what what he what they do there in Paracho is they invent tools out of anything. He makes his carving knife for, for the neck and for doing the uh, a grameal for binding out of an old car spring. Mm. A leaf spring on a car. His neighbor had a grinder. They'd cut it. They'd grind it. They'd make a really sharp edge, and he would carve his guitar necks with a leaf spring off of a car. And it worked great. He still uses that, even though Absolutely. he sells it worldwide. It, you, know, you don't need to spend the money that much it's it's quite convenient to have a nice router but you can get by without one nice to have all that stuff though <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to have all that stuff it's really all blessing. my routers are single use <laughs> yeah just uh just to give you guys a a heads up i've been working on a violin making course with a luthier out of cremona and mm -hmm. it's, it's gonna be coming out soon i'm almost to the end of it here the editing process but everything in there is done by hand Mm. it's amazing i mean at some points i'm looking at it thinking my god go to the sander or go to the band <laughs> or something. Yeah, i get frustrated looking at it it's like oh but it is all by hand so you guys if you're into hand tools that's the course yeah you know with the tools robbie i think um i sort of had two things happen to me because i had no tools when i started this i hadn't done any woodworking uh been around a lot of machining as an engineer but had, didn't have the hand tools and and so I, I got a, a, a few things, you know, um, a couple of planes and, um, and, a, and I figured out a router. I decided I was going to have a router for the bindings. And, and so for the first guitar, there's, there's a lot of things that I may do. Uh -huh. And I, I don't know that they're better or worse. Some of them were quite painful because, you know, it takes a long time to do it by hand. And with every instrument I build now, I'll say, hmm. I believe this time I'm going to do this the easy way <laughs> and I buy you know, a dedicated thing that does it. And so, you know, I, I think that's another thing is you don't have to have it all to do the first one. And in fact, you know, as you go along, I got some things on that first one that I'll probably never use again because I found something better for me. And also it's different for every person. Every person has some things that are easier for them than others. And, um, but yeah, it, it's almost like do it with the minimum and and I don't, I don't know that I would encourage anybody to waste money on cheap tools because a lot of times they just they never sharpen and, and you think it's you if you're a beginner and it's actually the tool right but, um I kind of have the same I, I have the same don't philosophy that, with uh I have the same philosophy with uh templates and jigs 
the beginning, my jigs were all, oh, man, they were Brazilian rosewood, nice and sanded to <laughs> a thousand grit, lacquered finish, French polish, you know, whatever. And then six months down the road, I went to change the design. <laughs> so, so now my tools are, or my jigs and templates are MDF and plywood. Yeah. They don't look good, but they're very functional in, yeah. case, in case you want to adapt and change things on the fly, which you will. You will. Yeah. A lot of mine, I actually take my drawing and take it to the local engineering print company and have them just print them on mylar because that mylar holds up and you can cut it and you can see through it and oh, that's it, it works wow. real yeah, well nice. yeah and I, I always go have a set of prints two sets of prints and a set of mylars and the mylars i cut into pieces yeah, and that's, uh, that's a great idea yeah i never even bothered to make the other patterns but uh, at the end of every build, I'll have to ask my print shop so at mm -hmm. the end of every build i run through a little thing all your engineers uh know about and that's good fast cheap Pick two, um, and I, and I look at what I've done, what you know, the struggles I've been through, or what went right or wrong on the build. And I think, all right, so what do, what do I want to have better? What do I want to do faster? Almost nothing comes out cheaper, but uh, um, you know, a good example is one of my New Year's resolutions. It's this year I'm going to spend more money on sandpaper. That's because I got a bad habit of using the same piece too long, and I should have thrown it away and got out a new piece. But this helps me make decisions like, okay, this time for the next build, I'm going to get the whole bearing set that goes with the uh, edge routing, you know, for binding the perf like and stuff like that. Boy, that was a big step, you know. So each each build, I think, okay, what am I going to buy for the next one? Well, the, the good news so is like you don't have to jump in all at once. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Luthier and Luthier podcast. Right. One of the interview I just listened to with Michael and Greenfield, mm -hmm. and, and he talks a bit about this that you. You put off for so long buying a certain tool or doing a certain thing. And once you finally get it, you just realize all the cost savings and time savings, everything for having the right tool for the right job um, that you should have done it so long ago. Yeah, but all of us are hobbyists. Right. Except Robbie. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm also to the point where, you know, I could invest in a new joiner or a new planer or what have you, but I've been getting by with the same one I got now for 20 years. I can't justify yeah. the upgrade. Yeah. So I'm still, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. I'm just, you know, pushing it along, kicking a can down the road here. I don't have the latest, greatest, but it works. You know, one thing uh, I think, Chris Bear, I guess I think about you with this. So you were, a, you were probably a master furniture builder. You built furniture. <laughs> you already knew a lot about how to make things and how to get tools to work. And and so for me, my first guitar was somewhat overwhelming because I couldn't even figure out how to sharpen my tools. You know, I couldn't even do some of the base skills for a while. And, um, and so I, I bought Robbie's kit, but about the same time, somebody thought they were going to do me a favor. And, and off of eBay, there was a Martin uh, triple lock kit somebody was selling that had been under somebody's bed well it came to the house and one of the sides was busted out and so i got the opportunity to fix that i was really glad your uh, video robbie showed about how to fix a, a crack in the sides but something that helped me on that guitar was that when the neck came it already was fairly close to the correct shape and it had these uh, little metal um, keys so you could take the fingerboard on and off so it had some things done that mattered and were, were quite tedious for me on my first guitar but for people who have, have never built a guitar and don't have the hand skills i think there's a set of things that for their first one they might be well advised to have lmi go ahead and do those for them um, because it's just it, it it just wears you out when you don't know what you're doing and if it's the tool or you you know that's so one of the I'm things really, that i i sent in an email to that guy i've been corresponding with over the last couple of days about tools he wanted to go get the hand you know, fret sliding jig or the table saw and this and that. I said, look, for 10 bucks, I don't think it's that. It's like eight bucks or something. I said, how about I slot the fretboard for you? For That's what I did. If, yeah. you're, if you're worried right. about tools that much, man, for eight bucks, you can solve your problem. And, and put the radius on it. You know, yeah. not, not argue with how you're going to do that. And and uh, I, I found that on that little Martin neck to be great. It was, you know, it was easy for me to take my tools and get it to where I wanted it because it wasn't a block of wood. It already was relatively close to the correct shape. And so I got to focus quickly on putting the body together, uh, putting binding some purflings on, getting the neck on. I mean, I had to work on the angle there, but um, it, it let me get something playable 
pretty quickly and get through the process before I just got so bogged down. And, and certainly you could do all those things with an LMI kit. And I'd kind of re recommend that particularly if people don't have the woodworking and hand skills and I didn't have those. So uh, that's another way to think about it. Yeah, I mean, Elena, I think too, it's not a bad idea to try to develop some, you know, baseline woodworking skills too, if you have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, like Robbie's going to be teaching at uh, Mark Adams. That's where I developed a lot of my skills, you know, I mean, and, uh, you know, if you have a place like that nearby, just to take a basic woodworking course or something like that, you learn a lot about just how to handle tools in general how to sharpen things, you know, how things cut, what's dangerous, what's not, you know. So I, I do think it's a good idea to try to develop your skills outside of like a, a pure luthery, you know, skill set, you know, from yeah. the start if you have that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, folks, we've used our hour. Anybody got any last comments? And we're going to uh, bail on out of here, I guess. I'm going to have to get some more microphones in order to do my presentation when it comes my turn. Mm -hmm. Everybody so far has had really nice microphones and everything for their recording. So, you know, this this will be me with a guitar case open on the street, I think. <laughs> I think uh, I think Mohammed had a question, Elaine. Okay, Mohammed. So, um, I just started a few weeks ago, and uh, I have most of the tools I'm practicing. Uh, one thing that I'm not sure whether or not I should buy is a drum sander. For my first guitar. Well, you could use that uh, scraper plane that uh, Peter just showed us there. That, mm -hmm. that was a good job. What, are you talking about the top, Mohammed? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, the top's a little different I, I story. Wouldn't, I wouldn't do the scraper plane on the top. Right, yeah. right. Um, I've I've recently gotten into doing my tops with a hand plane with the sixty-two low low angle jack, and man, if you get your plane really sharp. You can be very, very yeah, accurate uh, and very, very precise <laughs> if you want to. That's a lot safer. You can, oh, yeah. You yeah. can tear up a top in a hurry. Yeah. Steve, I'll always thank you for giving me that uh, uh, drum sander that it was, it was a shop built drum sander somebody had given to you. And you had it just long enough to figure out you wanted a real drum sander and you passed it on to me. And I had it just long enough to figure out I wanted a real drum sander. And I got that. <laughs> 1020 back there. It's and, still teaching that lesson to somebody else, I'll bet. Oh, yeah, I know exactly who has some guy down in Arizona. He came up here and picked it up. Wow. Yeah. So, Muhammad, yeah. um, I'll tell you that. So, when I did my first top, there's a fellow who internationally known teaches furniture building classes. He's kind of like Robbie, taught at community college for years and then opened up his own school. And, uh, and I had been to his school and you build a little table, but he's teaching you to sharpen and, and do basic things, cut, you know, cut to the line, that sort of thing. And so anyway, I started working on my first top and boy, I was just gouging plugs out of it with my plane. And so I called him and I said, I just got to have some help with this. And I went over to see Lonnie and took that top and uh, he pulled his big low angle jack out and went, whoosh, and it was as slick. <laughs> and I said, why can't I do that? And he said, your plane, I brought my plane. He looked at me and said, not sharp. Yep. It's not sharp. And so, um, uh, you know, Trevor Gore will tell you, you're going to get a, a better sounding guitar if you're cutting those with a plane instead of sanding them. But I, I will tell you what I did. So after I left Lonnie's, I made sure I kept that side that didn't have gouges in it for the outside. And then I started working on the other side. But it, it again, it was, I've talked to him last week and, and he, he said, you know, he was talking about that. And he said, you got to get your tools. You got to get those planes really sharp and then they can do it. Now, you know, if you're taking off millimeters of stuff, that can be quite a chore and a job. And I actually started with a safety planer right off on, on the back and, and size to get them down. But, uh, but I'll just tell you, if you're, put, I had bear claw and I thought, oh, it's just bear claw. Nope. Just wasn't sharp enough. And so all the sharpening matters and Robbie, I, I keep studying everybody's sharpening course, but you know, yours is a good one too on that. And uh, Thank you. But, but I encourage you, you can get there with a plane and it's not hard to deal on that spruce. You can go get too yeah, far yeah. in a hurry. But it's got to be it's sharp. a lot less expensive to buy a good plane than it is to buy a drum scene. That's true. Yeah, it doesn't take room and you don't need a dust collector. And, and you don't need <laughs> a high dollar plane, Mohammed. 
or anybody. You, you know, my first plane was a number five monkey wards plane that I inherited from my father-in-law. As soon as I sharpened it up, man, it worked great. Those old planes are really good. You know, those old <laughs> you, you can you can uh, make an old Stanley or an old Bailey work very very well. Yeah. Can, can I interject to offer the 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 opposite perspective? I sure. use my drum sander constantly. Uh, it's one of the most used tools in my shop, aside from uh, the um, um, bandsaw. So, Mohammed, I I say if you can find a drum sander uh, for cheap, get it. <laughs> yeah, well, I have the minimum good. size there. for the top. I, I use a 1020, so I use the real small one that you, you have to put through one side and then flip around and put through the other side. And it's not as good as a, as a wide one, for sure. And sometimes you do have to do a little handwork to clean up and make sure that everything is the same thickness all around. But it, it works great for me, and, and I just I find it a, a huge time saver. I use planes all the time, but I don't use them on the tops. Yeah, no, I, I use mine far more than I thought I would. I'm scared of doing that on my top. <laughs> so, I think Muhammad, the, 32 works pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, that's what I have. Right, Muhammad, the other thing is just when you have a question, if you, no matter how, how much you think, oh, they're going to laugh at me, nobody does. Just ask the forum. Just say, I'm trying to do blah, 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 blah. And there'll be somebody give you ideas on what to do about it. Don't hesitate because I promise you, somebody mm -hmm. else is out there watching it with the same question. Exactly. And, and and you'll get two perspectives. Like I have one, Chris has another. And I will tell you, I have a drum sander now and I just use it. So <laughs> I, I'm with Chris. But, uh, but, but that was a lesson that day in how those planes need to be sharp. So, uh, yeah. So we've spent a little over our hour. I really appreciate all of you being here. If, uh, as we say in Tennessee, Lord willing, the creeks don't rise. Greg Maxwell will talk to us next month. And uh, he, he's got a really cool guitar he's made and some wonderful inlays. And so, Doug, thank you so much. Yes, and thank you very much. Thank you for inspiring Doug, thanks for me. setting this up. And, and Peter, we're going to have you on again and see some of those goofy guitars you build that make no sense to anybody <laughs> but you. They're done. And, uh, <laughs> but, but thank you all so much for being here. So, Robbie, if you want to say some nice words, that's good. But I think we're we're all done. Yeah, I think uh, thanks uh, everybody for participating. Uh, this is just our second one here, so it's getting larger each time. But uh, I'm enjoying the heck out of it, and I, I think everybody's finding it very useful. So we'll see everybody on the forum, and uh, then we'll see you again here on the uh, Builder Showcase uh, next month then. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. Happy building, folks. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.